keep the dust down. Also, these tubes on the side uh, were put in to pump in fresh air. The gates that control the entrances or the flow of water through the two diversion tunnels were very different. There are two tunnels, each had a different type of a gate. This is the west gate, the right hand side. It was very simple, a very simple slide gate, and it was only used once. Uh, and that was when the a river was first diverted uh, and water was allowed to go through and when they began to create Lake Powell the right hand diversion tunnel was closed down. The left diversion tunnel was 33 feet higher and was intended only to be used when there were extra high flows coming down the river. And the entrance to that tunnel was much different. This is a trash rack that kept water, kept debris from getting into the much more sophisticated gate that was inside of the rock. You could reach that gate by way of a tunnel that came right out of the dam. So this tunnel was used for a much more sophisticated gate where they could actually control the flows. The slide gate on the right hand side, once it was closed, that was it, it stayed closed. Also, the shape of the tunnel changed uh, just upstream uh, from where the two tunnels would meet, where the spillway tunnels were going to meet the uh, diversion tunnels. Uh, this is the plug section, and this was a section where they poured the concrete into a tunnel that changed diameter so that the force of the lake would actually close the plug even tighter. The entrances to the spillway tunnels look like this as they were starting down, but this was going down into the walls of Glen Canyon at roughly a 45 degree angle, and it was much more difficult to drill these tunnels and get the rock out of the way. So these were only progressing at about eight feet per day. So in 1983, these are the tunnels that were being used to divert the water around Glen Canyon Dam, and it's at the bottom of these tunnels where the spillway tunnels were meeting the diversion tunnels where all of the, di the uh, damage was uh, sustained uh, during the high flows. Uh, here are the forms for pouring the concrete in the spillway tunnels. And looking down at the uh, rack that was used to finish off the tunnel after the concrete had been poured. And these are the two 52-foot high gates that are the entrances to the spillway tunnels. So these gates are to be raised anytime they want to release water around the dam. You actually don't allow water to go over the top, you allow water to go under them. In 1983, they added on to the top of these gates in order to keep water from going over the top and on end of the tunnels because the tunnels were being damaged. So 20 years after Glen Canyon Dam was finished, things turned really squirrely here. And uh, some people say that we almost lost Glen Canyon Dam because of those high flows. I'll show you the damage later on. There were a number of reasons why this particular site was chosen for Glen Canyon Dam. In general, it needed to be upstream from Lee's Ferry because this was going to be an upper river basin project, which begins at Lee's Ferry and extends upstream. So there needed to be a reservoir somewhere pretty close to Lee's Ferry, but on the upstream side. And then as to exactly where in the lower part of Glen Canyon it would go, it was dependent upon how many faults were in the area, uh, how deep, much poorer rock existed, and in this case it means uh, chimney shale, and also uh, was aggregate available for the making of the concrete. So this is Waweep Canyon under today's Waweep Bay, and this is where the aggregate came from for making the concrete. It was only a few miles away. Also, uh, just outside of Flagstaff on the north side, there was a mine where they mined pozzolan, a uh, type of uh, volcanic material that uh, gave concrete a better set and kept it from getting quite as warm without it. So back to the dam site again. Uh, we still haven't closed off the river, but 
here are the two spillway tunnels. Dam's going to go right in here. The batch plant for the concrete was located partway up the western wall. This building was actually 200 feet high and was capable of making eight cubic yards of concrete per minute. And they were laying uh, 300, or placing is the term the Bureau uses, they were placing uh, 300 cubic yards an hour uh, during the height of the work. The aggregate came from Huawei when stockpiled on the rim of the canyon. Here you can see the bridge in the background on the top of the, uh, uh, the batch plant is somewhere in here. And finally, after years of work, uh, four years of excavations, um, they began to get serious about pinching off the river and then excavating down not just the spillway, not just the uh, keyways for the dam, but going down through the riverbed. And they did this by going upstream uh, from the dam site, but downstream from the right tunnel entrance, and started bulldozing in boulders and other debris. This took three days of work to pinch off the Colorado. And at first they weren't expecting to have to put steel in here, but they just started using cables and throwing in whatever steel work they could find to kind of hold the boulders in place at first. But eventually they got this pinched off and the Colorado was uh, forced into the right diversion tunnel. Now that little dam that you see there grew to 300 feet high above bedrock, something like 165 feet above the surface of the water. So we just looked at the upstream coffer dam that's right in here, and here's the downstream coffer dam that's adjacent to the downstream exit of one of the uh, diversion tunnels, and the dam's going to go here in the middle, so they have diverted the Colorado around the dam site, and now we're going to excavate down for the foundations of the dam and also the power plant that's actually a separate structure just downstream from the dam. One of the old uh, black and white photographs that was in the files had these elevations marked on it. So as you probably know, uh, the elevation of Lee's Ferry is something like 3140 uh, feet above sea level. So uh, we're down below the, le the level of Lee's Ferry by quite a bit. Uh, here is the uh, downstream coffer dam up almost 300 feet above this and the base of the dam is going to go down to 3,005 feet. So they're almost down to the very bottom of Glen Canyon here. And what you find when you go down through the bed of the river is lots of sand and gravel for a long ways. Stuff that gets stirred up when the river is in flood. But what they want to do is get down below all, the, all of the sand and gravel and get down to bedrock and on into bedrock a short distance. Looking downstream at the uh, site, there's a temporary wall here that's holding back part of the downstream coffer dam. If you've ever taken a tour on the river from the base of the dam down to Lee's Ferry, you go down through an access tunnel, and this is that tunnel. And today, this is down about as far as you can go. So just look at all of this material, that, all of this dam that's down uh, below that grassy area that you see today. So they kept, kept excavating through lots of sand and gravel, but eventually they got down to bedrock, and this is what it looked like. To me, this looks like Vishnu Group Rock in Grand Canyon, but it's still part of the Navajo sandstone, but it's been sculptured like this, presumably by big floods of the past. So in a black and white photograph, it just looks exactly like Navajo, like a, uh, Vishnu group rocks in Grand Canyon, but all of this was blasted out, which seems like kind of a shame. But anyway, the very bottom of Glen Canyon, it was kind of an inner gorge with these sculptured walls. The keyways where the dam is going to meet the walls of the canyon were blasted out from the top down. Here you can see a blast that's taking place. 
And these went back uh, about 135 to 150 feet behind where the old canyon wall was, just to make sure that the dam was seated in really stable rock. There were also uh, tunnels drilled into the walls, and those tunnels are still there today, and they connect with tunnels that are inside of the dam. So you can actually walk <coughs> out of Glen Canyon Dam and right on into the rock. And inside those tunnels, which are very leaky, by the way, kind of have to wear a raincoat in the lower ones, uh, they have uh, measuring devices that measure how much the rock is being compressed by the force of the reservoir against the dam and the dam against the rock. These towers were built in the right uh, keyway, and these are going to carry a railroad track where once the batch plant has dumped a load into, um, into one of the carrying cars, it's transported out on a railroad track uh, to where the dam is going to be and then picked up by an overhead uh, cable and transported to the site where it's dumped. This is one of the uh, inspection tunnels that goes back into the rock. These are 200 feet long. We'll take a look at those later on as how they look today. And there we are finally down to the bottom of where they want to go. The dam is going to go here in the foreground. Uh, these are the beginnings of the towers that are going to be about 100 feet high that are going to carry the penstock tubes that go from the dam to the power plant. And then the power plant is going to be down here in this notch. So finally the day comes when they're going to start pouring concrete. It took uh, four years to get to this point. Uh, Lim Wiley is right here. He is an instruction man manager for the Bureau of Reclamation. He also uh, had a minor job uh, when Hoover Dam was being constructed, but by the time uh, 1956 rolled around, he was the head guy on this project. And the first loads of concrete. <coughs> So the dam was poured in blocks, and the pouring went on from 1960 until 1963, so three years of pouring concrete. Uh, there are fewer blocks in Glen Canyon uh, than there were blocks in Hoover Dam. They changed the design of the dam. Uh, for one thing, uh, Hoover Dam was in a much narrower canyon, uh, about half as wide as what Glen Canyon, uh, canyon is. And there were the blocks in Hoover were much smaller than this, uh, side to side and also front to back. The amazing thing is that Hoover was twice as thick as Glen Canyon Dam. Uh, Hoover is a little bit taller at uh, 726 feet. Uh, Glen Canyon is 710, so Hoover is just a little bit taller, but Hoover is twice as thick. It's almost as thick at the bottom as it is tall. Well, why was it built that way? Well, we didn't really know what we were doing. And so uh, labor was cheap. It's 19, uh, 1931 approximately when they started the dam, and uh, they really built that thing. And it's going nowhere. It's in an AMDA site. Um, much different, much better kind of rock. Uh, if you ask the Bureau of Reclamation engineers whether this one is safe, as good as Hoover Dam, I'm not sure they're going to compare the two dams, but they're going to say, we designed this dam to fit this situation. And indeed they did. They actually changed the design to fit the type of rock that was here. So from 1960, uh, the blocks of the dam and the power plant and the supports for the penstock tubes rose up. Uh, the biggest blocks were 60 by 120 feet, so they were about half the size of a football field. They would raise them seven and a half feet at a time. So that means in the middle of the canyon there were about 100 lifts, a 100 times where they would have to build up the concrete in these layers of seven and a half feet.
They were also very concerned about how hot the concrete would get because when you pour this much concrete, the heat buildup as it cures gets to expanding uh, the concrete and therefore later on when it cools, it contracts and